This is meeting five of criminal law. Our subject is the definition of criminal offenses. Different criminal offenses are defined as different sets of elements. We have covered the voluntary act requirement. We also covered liability for omissions to act. We've had a brief look at the doctrine of mens rea. Now we explore that doctrine more deeply. The Latin phrase mens rea, crudely translated, means the mind thing. The fundamental principle of mens rea can be stated this way. Actus non facet reum nisi mens sit reus. Or as the eminent Blackstone has it, every criminal offense combines an evil meaning mind with an evil doing hand. Our task is to understand how this principle works out. Another way, a more modern way, of referring to the mens rea idea is to call it culpability. When is an actor culpable for his voluntary acts? We will use the two terms mens rea and the culpability requirement more or less interchangeably as we proceed. The best way to expound the doctrine is to begin with a case. Regina versus Cunningham. Regina is the queen, and Cunningham was a hard-up bloke who was engaged to be married. When hitched, Cunningham and his bride were to move into number 7A Bakes Street, which was unoccupied but leased to Cunningham's prospective mother-in-law. Number 7A was next door to another residence, number 7B, occupied by an elderly couple, Mr. and Mrs. Wade. One evening, Cunningham went into the cellar of number 7A and removed the gas meter from where it was installed. Cunningham's reason for doing this will seem strange. It was because he was hard up for money. Did he intend to take the gas meter to a pawn shop? No. Cunningham intended to break open the meter to remove coins. Coin-operated gas meters were common in the UK at that time. They worked the way parking meters in the US used to work. You fed coins in and you got to heat your home for a while. The gas meter and its contents were not Cunningham's property. They were the property of the gas board. Cunningham's theft was discovered. He was prosecuted for the crime of larceny and convicted. When Cunningham tore the meter off the cellar wall, he neglected to turn off the gas. As a result, he loosed a frightful cloud of coal gas. The coal gas not only filled the cellar of number 7A, it percolated through the loose rubble wall that separated number 7A from number 7B, Bakes Street. The gas then wafted upstairs in 7B and nearly asphyxiated Mrs. Wade as she slept. For this, Cunningham was charged not only with larceny, but also under Section 23 of the Offenses Against the Person Act. Whosoever shall unlawfully and maliciously cause to be taken by any other person any noxious thing so as thereby to endanger the life of such person, shall be guilty of felony. Cunningham was convicted of this offense as well as lar larceny. He did not appeal from the larceny conviction, but he did appeal his conviction for endangering Mrs. Wade. The Court of Criminal Appeal quashed the prosecution under the Offenses Against the Person Act. The term to quash is alien to American criminal procedure. It means the conviction is set aside and the defendant cannot be retried. In the United States, standard procedure would allow a retrial. To understand why Cunningham's conviction was quashed, 
we bear in mind that it was unlikely that Cunningham knew he was causing cold gas to flow. He might have assumed that no gas would flow unless somebody had recently fed a coin into it, and no one had. With that in mind, we scrutinize the precise language of the statute. The actus reus is cause to be taken. Using our more modern terminology, we would call this the conduct element. But to be guilty of this offense, the actor has to have done more than cause someone else to be endangered by, say, the possibility of an explosion. The accused must cause it to be taken, and not merely a whiff of a noxious thing. It has to be a dangerous whiff. We can label the endangering the result element. So far, the conviction seems sound. Cunningham cannot deny having caused Mrs. Wade to inhale coal gas to the extent that her life was endangered. The appeal is based on another element of the offense, which is introduced with the word maliciously. This word, this adverb, states what we will call the culpability requirement. The word maliciously propels Cunningham's appeal. Most of the cases we will read are appellate opinions. When appellate courts reverse a conviction, they typically do so for one of two reasons. Insufficiency of evidence or erroneous jury instruction. In Cunningham, the error lay in the way the trial judge instructed the jury. This is what the trial judge said. He has not got to intend that it be taken. So to show that an actor maliciously caused a result does not require proving that the, that, that the actor intended that result. Does the appeals court find fault with this? No. This tells us that there are at least two kinds of culpability. Malice is one and intent is another, and that malice need not involve intent. Had the statute said intentionally rather than maliciously, the trial court itself might have quashed the prosecution. There was no evidence at all that Cunningham intended to fill the house he was about to move into with coal gas. So what does it take to show that a defendant acted maliciously? The trial court instructed the jury that it is sufficient that by his unlawful and malicious act, he causes it to be taken. Is this error? The appeals court finds it to be potentially misleading. The jury already found that the removal of the meter box was malicious or worse when it convicted Cunningham of larceny. There is no real dispute that the removal of the meter box caused the victim to take a noxious substance. So the jury could easily understand instruction number two to mean that it could instantly conclude by simple logic that Cunningham had acted maliciously as to the result, the endangerment. The error in instruction two is even more evident in another case, Regina versus Faulkner. Faulkner was a thirsty seaman. He broke into his ship's hold to steal some rum. To light his way, he held a torch. Some highly combustible rum that had spilled in the hold was accidentally touched off by the torch. This caused a fire that spread to the whole ship. Faulkner was prosecuted for larceny. To convict him, the Crown was able to show malice by showing intention to steal. The culpability concepts are in a hierarchy, and so showing a greater culpability than is necessary is always sufficient to show the lesser. Faulkner's intention to steal established that his conduct was malicious. The loss of a snort of rum was as nothing compared to the loss of the ship. And so the Crown also prosecuted Faulkner for arson. 
the conviction for arson was quashed on Faulkner's appeal. The Crown had failed to show malice as to the burning of the ship. The Crown was not allowed to borrow Faulkner's malice in stealing the rum and slap it onto the burning of the ship. Cunningham's case is closely analogous. Malice as to the taking of the gas meter does not simply transfer to everything caused by the conduct of taking. The trial court's error in this respect is most obvious in the third of the challenged jury instructions, which we will look at in the following video.